And I do invite you to open your Bible with me as we turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. And as you're turning there, I just want to let you know what's coming in these next several weeks. Uh, we are going to be in the month of September, when we get to September 11th, we'll be starting a sermon series. We're going to take a, a pause briefly for a few weeks from the Gospel of John, which we've been working through this year. And we're going to start a new series for six weeks and it's going to be called Five Things Every Christian Needs to Grow. And this is going to be a great series. If you are a new Christian, maybe you're very um, new to the faith, it'll be a great series for you to learn about what does the Bible say that we need, what are some of the key things we need to grow as Christians. They're not the only five things we need, but they're five big things. But even if you're a long-time believer, these are going to be important because we need constant reminders about going back to the basics, back to the core teachings of Jesus and what he told us we need if we're going to be his followers. It's easy to drift away from those things. The last couple of years, especially with COVID, a lot of people have gotten out of spiritual habits that they had previously been in, and when you get out of those habits, it's very hard to get back into those habits. So we're going to sort of go back to the basics, talk about what does Jesus say that we need to do and to be as his followers. And in addition to that being a sermon series, we're going to have a number of small groups that engage in a Bible study that goes along with the series. So I'm just telling you that now so that you can be aware that that's coming. September 11th is when the series is going to start. You'll be hearing a lot more about that in the coming weeks. But for now, we're going to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Uh, we'll be reading the whole of chapter 9 this morning. Hear now the word of the Lord. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground, and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind, and now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. 
You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning asking that you would open our eyes. Lord, apart from the illumination of your spirit, we cannot know you, we cannot understand your word, we can know nothing. But we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. And so now we ask that you would illuminate your word for us so that we can understand it this morning, so that we can believe it, and so that we can obey it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've always been somewhat fascinated by the, the grandeur, I guess you might say. I don't know if that's the right word, but the, the size and scope of the Mississippi River. Uh, it's the second longest river in North America, flowing 2,350 miles from its source at Lake Itasca to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's an incredibly long river, but it's also a river that has an incredible volume of water. I was looking up these stats, and it's, it's amazing. It, apparently, it discharges 16,792 cubic meters of water per second into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, one of the things I've always found fascinating about the Mississippi River is how much it varies in terms of its width. So at the most northern section, there are parts of it that are only between 20 and 30 feet wide. But as you go further south, it gets considerably wider. Apparently, the widest part of the Mississippi can be found at Lake Winnebagoshish. I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. That's in Minnesota. You thought all the hard-to-pronounce names were here in Wisconsin. Well, not just in Wisconsin. Lake Winnebagoshish in Minnesota, it is wider than 11 miles at that point. Uh, the widest navigable section in the shipping channel is in Lake Pepin, where the channel is approximately two miles wide, and two miles is still pretty stinking wide. I once heard someone say that when we think about spiritual awakening or spiritual conversion. That process is a bit like swimming across the Mississippi River from one bank to the other side. Uh, swimming across the Mississippi could be a very quick event, or it could be a long process, depending on where you cross the river. And in the same way, for some people, spiritual conversion is very sudden and instantaneous. You see examples of this in the Bible. So, for instance, uh, Levi, the tax collector, also known as Matthew, had a very instantaneous, sudden spiritual conversion. Jesus walks up to him and says, come and follow me. He just gets up and walks off, and he does a 180, and in basically a split second, this man has a conversion, uh, and his life is turned around. The Apostle Paul had a very sudden spiritual conversion where he's on the road to Damascus, this blinding light comes from heaven, and a voice speaks to him, and, and basically in a day, his life is changed. So we can see that for some people, the process of spiritual awakening is very sudden and it's instantaneous. However, there are others for whom it is a gradual crossing over, it's a gradual process, and for some of you, you might be able to relate to that. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, and you can't point back to a specific day or a specific moment in time when you were spiritually awakened, but that process for you was a period of weeks or maybe months or maybe even years. 
It can be gradual. It can be instantaneous. We see both kinds of things even in Scripture. In John chapter 9, we encounter the story of this man who is blind from birth. And and this chapter starts with just a physical healing of this blind man. But what I want to show you this morning is that as this chapter goes on, it's really not a chapter about Jesus opening his physical eyes. It's about Jesus opening his spiritual eyes. And it's a spiritual awakening that we have in this chapter. But it's not a sudden and instantaneous one like we have with Paul or Levi. It's a gradual one that unfolds over a process that takes time. Look at the beginning of the chapter again. It starts with these words. It says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the disciples are operating with an assumption here. It's a faulty assumption. They were assuming that all sickness and suffering was directly related to personal sin. So they see this man, they see that he's born blind, and they think, well, either this man is a real serious sinner, or his parents were real serious sinners, and this blindness is God's judgment because of something bad that they did. Now, we should note, there are occasions where sickness or suffering is due to our own sin, and you see that in the Bible. For instance, uh, when Miriam was disobedient to God... God struck Miriam with leprosy as a direct result of her disobedience. And you could find other examples as well, where sometimes sickness or suffering is the result of disobedience to God, but the Bible makes clear that not all sickness or suffering is the result of personal sin. Some of it is due to the fact that we simply live in a broken world where broken things happen. Jesus makes it clear in his response to the disciples. He says in verse 3, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, Jesus is saying this man's blindness has a greater purpose in God's plan. That God was going to use it to display his glory. That in and of itself is a comforting reminder that when we go through, as believers, suffering, when we go through trials, when we go through pain, none of that is ever wasted by God, but that God uses those things for our good and for his glory. We may not always be able to see how he is using it, but he does. I like these words from R.C. Sproul. He writes, Only God knows why we go through the things that we do, but the promise of God is that he brings good out of everything that befalls us and uses the worst pain, the worst suffering, the most confusing events in our lives to bring about, ultimately, his glory. This is what Jesus wants the disciples to see. And then verse 6, if you jump ahead to verse 6, after he talked with them, having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes in the mud, with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Imagine what that would have been like if you were that man. This isn't a man who was, who was born with good eyes and then became blind later, so he has some kind of reference point to understand what certain things looked like. He had never been able to see, and so he was seeing everything for the first time. He was seeing light for the first time. He was seeing people for the first time. He was seeing nature for the first time. He was seeing everything for the first time. But there was one thing I believe that he wanted to see more than anything else, and I think that was Jesus. He wanted to see the man who had healed him. It, it says he came back seeing. And, and, and I'm reading between the lines here, but, but why did he come back? Perhaps it was to see the one who had healed him, among other things. So he came back. And it's at this point that we begin to discover that this story is really not about the miracle of a man receiving his physical sight. There's a much greater miracle that's going to take place, and that is this man's spiritual sight being restored. There's a gradual spiritual awakening of this blind man, and it really kind of, you see it unfold in three stages. So first of all, he just views Jesus as a man. After Jesus heals the blind man, 
Uh, the neighbors begin to talk about what's happened. There's some debate. They say, is this really the man that was born blind? I don't think it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. So they ask him, they call him, and they ask him how he'd been healed. And in verse 11, he says, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. Now I want you to notice, at this point, the only way he describes Jesus is as a man. From his perspective, all he knows is that there's this man named Jesus. Jesus anointed his eyes, and after all of that happened, he came back seeing but as far as we can tell at this point, he doesn't understand Jesus as anything beyond just a man. Granted, a man who has a lot of extra uh, power here to perform a healing, but he's a man. You know, it's a reminder that a person can experience the healing power of God without necessarily experiencing the saving power of God. Those are two different things in Scripture. Uh, this man had been healed by Jesus. But he had not been saved from his sins. He had not been saved by Jesus because he had not yet believed in Jesus. And the Bible makes very clear that the only way in which a person can be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ and faith alone. And so what we have here is a man who's experienced the healing power of God. He hasn't yet experienced the saving power of God. That's still true today. I mean, how many times uh, have perhaps you seen a situation where there's someone who's not a believer and they get sick or they're in the hospital and they have believing friends and family members who are praying for them and then they they eventually get well and God heals them because ultimately we know ultimately all healing comes from God no matter what the the uh, secondary means might be but they they get well again and and you'd think that perhaps someone might recognize God's hand and 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 turn to God in faith but yet they may not and that's because you can experience the healing power of God without experiencing the saving power of God. That is basically where this man is at right here. He views Jesus as just a man who had healed him. But that changes as the story goes on. Because in the second stage, he's, he, he begins to not just view Jesus as a man, he reveres him as a prophet. So later on, the Pharisees come and they find this man. They want to know what's going on. They want to investigate. And verse 17 says, So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. I want you to notice there's a, there's a spiritual progression there. He no longer describes Jesus as a man. He reveres him as a prophet. And there are many people in the world today who would share that same view. They don't see Jesus as the son of God or the savior of the world, but they see him as a great prophet or a great spiritual teacher, perhaps. I mean, the second largest religion in the world is Islam, and, and within the religion of Islam, Muslims view Jesus as a prophet and actually have a very high regard for Jesus as a prophet. And in a sense, those who view Jesus as a prophet, they are correct that he was a prophet. He came to speak the word of God to us. That, but the problem is, he's just, he's much more than a prophet. The problem with those who view Jesus as a prophet is not that they're wrong, it's just that that there, there's so much more that they haven't grasped. Jesus is not merely a prophet. He's not merely a great teacher. He is the son of God and the savior of the world. And that is who he claimed to be. You can either accept it or you can reject it. But that is what Jesus claimed. At this point, when the Pharisees questioned this man, it's clear that his understanding had progressed. He was moving closer to the truth, but he had not yet arrived at the truth. His spiritual eyes had not yet been fully opened. And so then you see the third stage of his awakening is that he doesn't just view Jesus as a man or revere him as a prophet, but he eventually worships Jesus as God. You look ahead in this story as it continues, the, the Pharisees eventually question this man a second time. And after arguing back and forth with him, they, they cast him out of the synagogue. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But after Jesus... Uh, finds, after this, Jesus finds him and they have this conversation. And it's, amazing. it's an amazing conversation. Verse 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Son of Man was a, a title from the Old Testament that was really a divine title that Jesus used for himself. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Tell me who he is. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, 
and it is he who is speaking to you. In other words, translation, I'm standing right in front of you. Do you believe in me? And he said, Lord, I believed, and he worshiped him. Now, I would argue it was at this point that he became fully awakened and believed in Jesus. It was at this point that he worshipped him as God. How do we know that he understood him as God? Well, no Jewish person would have been worshipping anything except if they believed that that person was God. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't tell him to stop worshipping. If you read the book of Revelation, towards the end of the book of Revelation, when, when the angel speaks to the apostle John, John is so overcome by the presence of this angel that he begins to bow down and worship this angel because it's just so overcoming. And do you remember what the angel says to the Apostle John? He says, stop worshiping me. Because there is only one person, one being in the universe that deserves worship, and that's God alone. So the angels, when someone's tempted to worship them, says, say, they say, stop. Well, Jesus didn't say stop. He didn't say to this man, don't do what you're doing, because what this man was doing was appropriate. He recognized and he saw that Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. This was the blind man's spiritual awakening. Now, what's interesting about this chapter is that if you go back and you walk through it again, you will see that in this chapter, simultaneous to this man's spiritual awakening, there's something else going on, and that is that there's the Pharisees are being spiritually hardened. The Pharisees and this blind man are going in opposite directions. While he's moving closer and closer and closer to Jesus, they're moving further and further away from Jesus, and you can see that by the way that they respond to the work of, the, work of Jesus through the blind man. So look at it again with me, and you'll see it kind of unfolds in three stages. In the first part, they just begin by questioning this blind man. They, they go on a fact-finding mission to see what happened, and they question him. Verse 13 says, They brought to the Pharisees the man who had, been, who had formerly been blind, and now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. So at this point, they're just, they're questioning him. They want to know what's going on. And some of them conclude that Jesus can't be from God because he's breaking the Sabbath. Now, why they think he's breaking the Sabbath is not entirely clear here. It may be because there were rules against making clay on the Sabbath. In the rabbinic tradition, there was rules against making clay on the Sabbath because that was considered work. So when Jesus spit into the ground and made some mud, they may have thought, well, that's basically the equivalent of making clay. And according to the rabbinic law, that's a violation of the Sabbath. Of course, they were always trying to figure out how Jesus was violating something. But some of them said, this man can't be from God. Others pointed out that if Jesus were sinning, well, then how would he be able to do these great miracles? And so there was disagreement among them. But they start just by questioning him. But then notice they move from questioning the blind man to reviling the blind man. Verse 24, it says, So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Love to see the looks on their faces when he said that one. And what did they do? It says, they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple but we are disciples of Moses. Now, they hadn't learned anything because we saw earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus already told them, if you were disciples of Moses, you'd be following me because Moses spoke about me. But they hadn't gotten that. And the great irony here is they tell this man, give glory to God. They say, if you are going to glorify God, you're going to declare him to be a sinner. The irony is that that's exactly the opposite is the case. They think they're glorifying God by, by declaring Jesus to be a sinner. It's the blind man who's glorifying God by refusing to declare Jesus to be a sinner. And when he refuses, their frustration basically turns to hatred. They revile him. 
So then in the third stage, they don't just revile him, but they cast him out. Verse 29. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the beginning of the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us. And they cast him out. Jesus had performed a great miracle among the people, and yet the Pharisees refused to recognize the work of Jesus. And by rejecting the blind man... Really, they were rejecting Jesus. They had become spiritually hardened. And what stands out as this chapter comes to an end is that the man who had been born blind is the only one who can seem to see clearly at the end, right? And the people with good eyes are totally blind. That's the great paradox. Verse 39, Jesus says these fitting words. He says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. You see, the Pharisees thought that they could see clearly, and that was exactly why they were blind, because they could not recognize their blindness and their need for the awakening that can only come from Jesus Christ. Many of you are familiar with the famous American author and speaker, Helen Keller. Uh, she lost both her sight and her hearing with a bout of illness at about 19 months old. And for a time, she communicated primarily using home signs until the age of seven uh, when she met her first teacher and lifelong companion named Ann Sullivan. And in referring to Ann Sullivan, Helen Keller wrote these words. She said, Gradually, I got used to the silence and darkness that surrounded me and forgot that it had ever been different until she came, my teacher, who was to set my spirit free. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you could basically say those words, but in a much, much deeper and a much, much more profound sense about the Lord Jesus. Because what the Bible makes clear is that every single one of us is similar to the blind man in John 9. We are born blind. Now, I'm not talking physical blindness here. I'm talking about spiritual blindness. Every single one of us is born in spiritual blindness. And for many of us, we get so accustomed to that blindness that we don't even realize that we are in darkness until Jesus comes and he opens our eyes, and he sets us free. And unlike Ann Sullivan, Jesus is not just a teacher. And he's not just a prophet. He's the son of God. He's the savior of the world. And he's still opening the eyes of men and women and boys and girls today. So I invite you to turn with me to the Lord Jesus in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. For those of us who are sitting here this morning, Lord, and we are believers, and we know you, we thank you for opening our eyes, we thank you for taking away our Blindness for removing the scales and helping us to see clearly and to trust in you. And Lord, there may be some of us sitting here this morning who are still not fully aware or awakened to the reality of who you are. There may be some of us sitting here this morning that are like the blind man, but we're in the middle of that journey somewhere and they're not fully aware. I pray that you would open the eyes of any who do not fully know you and help them to turn and to trust in you, to do what the blind man did and to say, Lord, I believe and I worship you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.